Hey guys, Pete here. It's happening again. Twin Peaks finally made it back to TV. This will be my review and recap of parts one and two of The Return, which is technically two episodes in the beginning of season three, but really it's just one big long episode. So if you haven't watched it yet, this will contain a ton of spoilers and will basically ruin it. So if you haven't watched it, go watch it now and then come back. The way I do my recap and review is I go through the entire thing, what happened, who we met, all that stuff, and then at the end we talk about the possible theories and things that are going on and going through our minds at the end. I will put a timestamp link in the bottom if you don't want to recap, you just want to talk about what's happening, and that will skip you to the end. So, at long last, it did debut, and it was awesome, I have to say. I mean, I don't have any problems with any of it. I think I'll get into a lot more of that later, but I think both diehard fans and newbies will enjoy this new season. So it starts out with old footage first. We get a glimpse back to the waiting room or the red room and we see Laura tell Cooper that she'll see him again in 25 years. This is all before the opening credits, which is a new opening credit scene. Still has the same awesome song, but it has a different look now. We don't have the little bird that's sitting there and all that kind of stuff. Our first new scene is the giant, who was an original character, and Cooper, who we assume is the good Cooper that's in the lodge. And they're in a new room, and I don't know if this is White Lodge or if this is just some other place we haven't learned about yet. He has a phonograph player there, the giant does, and he tells Cooper to listen to the sounds. We can't tell what they are. And he says that they are in their house now. He says, remember 4.30, Richard and Linda. And then he says, two birds, one stone, which I didn't understand, but Coop tells us that he understands. The giant then says, you are far away, and Cooper disappears from the room. We see another old character we know, Dr. Jacoby, who now lives in a camp out in the woods, which it doesn't tell us at the bottom where it is, but we do see Douglas Fir, so we should assume, based on what we know from the secret history, that he's still in the Twin Peaks area. He's getting a delivery of shovels, and no idea what that's all about, but the guy who's delivering him asks him if he wants any help, and Dr. Jacoby says he likes to work alone. Then we go to New York City, which is brand new territory for Twin Peaks. We meet a new character, and we see this crazy, yet unexplained setup with a chamber made of glass. It has a hole, like porthole to the outside, and it's sealed with cameras all around it. The guy who's watching it seems super straight-laced and meticulous, and we see that there's tight security. We meet another new character named Tracy. She's a female, and she is bringing coffee for the guy who is watching the box. Neither one of them seems to be from that area. They're both students, it seems like, from in the Midwest somewhere, based on their accents and the way they talk. She asks to get inside. He won't let her in, saying that it's top secret. Then we get a shot of the Great Northern, and we find out Ben Horn is still there. He's still in charge. He has this awesome wooden nameplate on his desk. And we also see his brother, Jerry, who is now a stoner who has formed a new business growing weed for the horns. We also meet Ashley Judd, who is his new assistant or new secretary, but we don't find anything else out about her except for Ben says he's not sleeping with her and that she's married. Over at the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department, we see that Lucy has not changed much at all. When this uh, insurance man comes in, he asks, to see the sheriff and she asks which one. We find out two important things here, I would guess. One, that one of the Sheriff Trumans is sick, that would be Harry S. Truman, and that his older brother is out fishing, that's Frank Truman. She doesn't tell us this directly, but we can infer it from what we know. We then get this cre creepy little driving scene in the back woods or wherever, we can't really tell where it's at, and we see this slick Mercedes, and then, oh my god, Cooper gets out, and it's clearly the evil Cooper who has a brand new look. And immediately we see him kick some ass, we meet a guy named Otis, a woman named Beulah, and he tells her that he needs Ray and Daria, and takes them along with him. There's a, little, there's a little thing here where they both look like they give an index card to this little guy that's sitting in a wheelchair in the back of the room. I'm not sure if that's important or not, but it was kind of weird. The security guard is missing when Tracy comes this time, and that lets her get inside the room. The guy explains he doesn't understand what the glass box is for, 
and things escalate to where they start to have sex and they find out briefly what the box is going on with it before a shadow figure comes out and basically kills them by biting them in the face. That's the best I could tell. I think it was literally they were bitten in the face to death. Then we go to our next destination, which is Buckhorn, South Dakota. The police there come to investigate a strange smell. It's a funny scene, and it's uh, some new characters there, but none of them seem very important, except maybe Max Perlich, who plays a character who seems to be up to something. The cops obviously find a dead body, or possibly bodies, because it looks like the head is of a female and the body is a male. From there we go to and we see the log lady, one of my favorite characters, and we're, it's really awesome to see her back. And she calls deputy, or should I say chief deputy Hawk, on the phone saying that her log has a message for him. She says, the log tells him that something is missing and you have to find it. It has something to do with Special Agent Dale Cooper. The way you will find it, it has something to do with your heritage. This is a message from the log. Hawk doesn't look too put out by the whole scenario, like maybe she calls him from time to time, and he just sits there and thinks. Back in Buckhorn, we find out the head is Ruth's, the person whose apartment they were it was found in, but the body is a male John Doe, and the police have found a ton of prints from someone named William Hastings inside and all over the apartment. Mr. Hastings gets arrested, and we'll find out more about him later. Back at the station, we see that Hawk has pulled out some boxes, we see Andy for the first time, and we find out that Cooper has been missing since before Wally was born. Wally is their son, we imagine, and Wally is now 24 years old, which means that no one has seen Agent Dale Cooper since the season 2. Hawk tells them not to worry about how long it's been since they've seen Cooper, but in the morning they're going to look for some files. He tells them to get everything ready and he'll bring the coffee and donuts. In South Dakota, the police search Bill's house and they find what looks like a finger in the trunk. In the process of that, we find out that him and his wife pretty much hate each other and that he was having an affair with Ruth. He swears to his wife, though, that he wasn't there, but he had a dream that night. Sounds a little suspicious, but we don't find out anything more about it at that moment. He tells her that he knows that she's having an affair with his lawyer, and we find out that she's pretty much glad that he's going to prison for life. After she leaves, we see a dark character in a cell nearby that disappears or does something supernatural and goes away at the end of the scene. When she gets home, she finds Coop in her house, the evil Coop, obviously, and he kills her with the lawyer's gun. Now, it seems that she knew him, so he was behind everything that happened there, but he then leaves, and the wound looks kind of strange, but I don't know if there's anything to that or not. We head to Las Vegas, and we meet Mr. Todd, who hands his assistant or someone who works for him named Roger some cash. He says, tell her she has the job. Roger asks why Mr. Todd lets him make him do things like that, and Mr. Todd says that he hopes that Roger will never know what it's like to have someone like him in his life. So we find out that Mr. Todd is in business with someone that he doesn't want to be in business with. We see a railroad crossing in a diner, and we find Coop inside with Ray and Daria. Ray has access to information through a contact we learn is Hastings' secretary. Cooper makes it very clear that he doesn't need anything, that he wants things, and that this information is something that he wants. He also tells them that he's going to be heading out on his own soon, and he better be able to trust that information is good. There's no uh, location title here to say where this is. In the beginning of the episode, I thought that might mean that the scenes that weren't marked were in the Twin Peaks area, but this kind of throws that out of the kind of throws it out of whack at this point. So I'm not sure where he is. Somewhere between South Dakota and somewhere else, perhaps. We catch up with Hawk again while he's walking through the woods, and the log lady calls him on the phone. We immediately realize where he's going when he says, when she says, the star turns and a time presents itself. Sure enough, he's where Agent Cooper entered the lodge, and we get a look inside. The good Agent Cooper and Mike are sitting inside the red room, and Mike says, Is it future or is it past? Someone is here. Then Mike disappears, and Laura walks into the room. She's aged 25 years, as is Cooper, for, the, for what it's worth, and at first she tells him he can go out now, then asks if he recognizes her. Cooper asks if she's Laura Palmer, and she says she feels like she knows her, but sometimes her arms bend back. 
He asks who she is, and she answers Laura Palmer. To which he says, well, Laura Palmer's dead, and she says, I am dead, and yet I live. Then she removes her face, more or less, and we see that she's basically made of light, like there's light flowing out of the inside of her being. He asks when he can go, and then she approaches him. She gives him a kiss and then whispers in his ear like his dream from the original series. He seems startled by what he hears, and then she starts screaming. I don't know exactly how to describe what happens next, but basically while she's screaming, she flies up into the sky or towards the ceiling and disappears. Wind starts blowing around inside, then we see the curtains moving, we see the white horse before it turns black, and then Mike returns to ask the same question again. Mike then takes Cooper outside of the room, and we learn how they solved the Michael J. Anderson problem. Remember, Michael J. Anderson was the man from another place who we knew wasn't coming back for this season. The arm, or the man from the other place, has evolved into a tree of sorts. He asks Coop if he remembers his doppelganger. The tree asks Coop that. And we see more old footage where we're reminded how that all went down at the end of season two. And perhaps some of that stuff is from Firewalk with me as well. The arm tells Cooper that his doppelganger has to come back in before he can go out. Back outside, we see Evil Coop stashing his Mercedes and getting into what looks like law enforcement or FBI kind of car. The guy Jack we met earlier is hiding it for him, and before he leaves, he grabs Jack's face and rubs it until it almost looks like he's frozen in time there. Evil Cooper arrives back at a hotel room where Daria is talking on the phone. She lies and says she was talking to Jack, but we gather that she's probably talking to Ray. Evil Coop lets her know that he was recording the conversation and eventually kills her, but before that we find out Ray got popped and that he had spoken to the secretary. We also learn that someone wanted to have Cooper killed and she was supposed to do it, and that Cooper was supposed to return to the lodge, but he has a plan on how to get out of that. After he kills Daria, he pulls out a case that looks really similar to what Wyndham Earl was carrying around in Season 2. He talks to someone that he thinks is Philip Jeffries. The person doesn't confirm who it is, but says that Coop is going back into the lodge tomorrow and that he will be with Bob again. Cooper then gets on an, old, an odd looking computer in the box. It, it looks like it's connected to the FBI, but it's sort of all flickering and I'm not really sure what's going on with that. Either way, he downloads all the info about, about the prison and then goes next door where we meet Jennifer Jason Lee's character, Chantel. He tells her he needs her to go clean up next door where he murdered Daria and then she has to go get her boyfriend because he needs her and Hutch in a particular place in a couple of days. Back inside the lodge, the arm says 253 time and time again, then repeats Bob, Bob, Bob. At the end of that, he says go now and we see Mike and Cooper leave that room. The sequence that follows is mysterious and hard to follow, but basically what we see is Agent Cooper moving through the rooms. He runs into Leland at one point, who says, find Laura, and then we see Mike and the arm again, and Mike says that something's wrong. The arm says it's his doppelganger, and we see that not only Cooper has a doppelganger. The arm's doppelganger appears and then sends Cooper out of the lodge after he gives him a glimpse of evil Coop driving down a highway. Agent Cooper passes through the glass box where we see those characters briefly, but it doesn't seem like they see him. It seems like they were outside the room when he passes through. It's impossible to tell exactly what's going on here, but it seems like we can gather that Agent Cooper is back and is no longer in the lodge. Now, is he in New York? We don't know. Is he just passing through there? No idea. After that, we get a couple more looks at the town of Twin Peaks. We see Laura Palmer at home in the old Palmer house, drinking and watching a pack of lions overtaking a water buffalo. Then we go back to the roadhouse where we see Shelley out with some friends. James comes in with another new character with a British accent, and we find out that he had a motorcycle accident and that he's more quiet now. Shelley says he's still cool, though, just like he has always been cool. We find out that Shelley has a daughter named Becky, but nothing more about that, and we also see what looks like Jack Renault working behind the bar. It is the same actor you can find out in the credits, but now it says that he's listed as Jean-Michel Renault, so we don't know anything more about that. 
Right underneath that, too, we can see that Al Stro Strobel, who is the actor who plays Mike, is actually the person that the evil Coop was talking to, not Philip Jeff Or, well, it says he is Philip Jeffries, or played Philip Jeffries, so it's not conclusive one way or the other, but it does say that that was Mike's voice that we heard through the machine. So, mystery with a side of mystery. Lots of Black Lodge stuff to think about, plus a big nod to the frosty inside of things with the final scene at the Roadhouse. I can't lie, I loved it. I pretty much loved all of it, and yeah, loved it. It was Twin Peaks, it was different, and yet it was the same. Just like Laura's dead, yet she lives. Now, I haven't thought too deeply about things yet or read anything else, but my initial reaction is that we're going to be in for a wild ride for the next 16 episodes. I wasn't expecting less, but, you know, it's kind of hard to figure out which direction they were going to go in. And I think they captured enough of what we already knew and just went into a direction that's working right now. If the Good Cooper's been missing for the past 25 years until this new celestial event, which opened the lodge again, where does the scene with the giant fit in with that? That's the thing that's kind of bugging me the most right now is that we have that as the opening scene in real, you know, in present time or whatever, but it could really happen anytime in between season two and season three. In present time, or at least the, you know, the main timeline of the show, it's clear that he has a dilemma. The evil Coop is supposed to be returning to the lodge, but he has no intention of doing so. But the Arms doppelganger has a plan as well, which seems to be contrary to Mike and the Arms plan. And let's just go ahead and mention that right now. Who's good and who's bad there? Is there good and bad there? I mean, in Cooper's case, we know that there was the normal Cooper who was essentially good and that he has a doppelganger that is essentially not good. But the man from another place is like a totally different story. And there's Mike outside, Philip Michael Gerard, and then there's Mike inside. And it's not really clear whose side anybody's on inside there. With that in mind, here are the big questions that I'm thinking about other than that whole thing with the giant. First and foremost, how did Cooper originally disappear, disappear from Twin Peaks? Based on what we heard from Andy and Lucy, it seems like it's been so long that it, you know, basically everyone just accepts it. It's faded to memory for the most part. What's going on with Laura? She went somewhere, but where? Leland seems to think that she needs to be found, but is he aware of what Cooper just saw? I mean, basically, Leland could have just been sitting in that chair for the last 25 years, for all we know. And that brings up a big point. Does anything actually happen in the waiting room as far as time is concerned? Or were all these characters somewhere else and then they just all came back together there because of what's going on with the planets? What the hell does Jacoby need so many shovels? I mean, that scene was in there for a reason, but it, you know, we didn't really get much more information about it at all. Now, the giant and the arm both mention numbers, number 430 and 253. They sound like times, but why, are that, why would they be important as times? And is this something that we're supposed to be able to piece together or just random things to add to the mystery? The giant also mentioned Richard and Linda, but the arm only mentioned Bob. So names, numbers, I don't know if they're supposed to be some kind of, you know, yin and yang going on there or not. We saw a ri you know, several of the original characters, but we know from you know, the cast list and everything that a lot more haven't shown up yet. I think they did a pretty good job with the ones they aren't able to you know, still have in the show, like Philip Jeffries and the man from another place now just being the evolution of the arm. Based on the final scene, I feel like we will definitely be getting plenty of soap opera-y uh, kind of stuff, you know, in the future episodes. I don't think people who missed that are going to be left out. This one was somewhat dark, but it was really more of just filling in kind of key elements that we need to go to move forward. The glass box and the South Dakota storylines are completely mysterious for the most part. I mean, obviously, Evil Coop slash Bob is tied to the South Dakota storyline, but is the, that character that we saw, the black character in the jail, is that supposed to literally be Bob? I mean, there's no way to know. At least the figure that killed the people in the New York scene seems to be something brand new. But why don't you guys tell me what you think in the comments, because there's just a lot to speculate in all of that. So like I said, I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to watching episodes three and four as soon as I finish editing this one. It, this is long, I know, but it was a longer episode, so in the future these won't be so far dragged out. 
make sure you subscribe to my channel and check back because I'll be doing a bunch of different stuff throughout this Twin Peaks season. I've been working on a secret history video that should be coming out between episodes at some point. After I read that Mark Frost announced that the final book is going to be coming out after this season, I realized that that's probably a lot more important. So I've been going back through it and finding some interesting stuff to share with you guys about that. Also, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments. I may do a Q&A if there is enough interest. And I will be researching and reading and looking at everything getting my hands on in between now and the time a new episode airs. So there will probably be another video related to this in one way or another. But for now, it's time to move on. So thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.